Now, I'm going to ask you a very difficult question. How many of you want to leave a good inheritance? It's not a trick question. I saw somebody like, yeah, yeah, we want to, don't we? And, and so it's not that we don't want to. We really do want to. But the problem is that we're dealing with all of our bad day-to-day -day stuff uh, that we don't have much time to think about our good long-term stuff, right? I mean, you got bills to pay, right? Uh, you got aches and pains to deal with. Uh, you got children to deal with or grandchildren to deal with. You got the world and its problems to deal with. And sometimes you can get so inundated in all of those things that you can forget about tomorrow. In fact, the Bible does tell us, right, that uh, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't plan. It means you don't worry about tomorrow. It doesn't say you don't plan for tomorrow. And so many of us, uh, uh, believers or unbelievers, uh, when we end, get at the end of our lives, whether that's 50 years or 60 years or 80 years or 100 years, we all would hope that we have left a good inheritance. But oftentimes what we leave is bills, pain, and suffering. Is that not right? All right. However, today I want to talk about leaving behind a good inheritance. If you would, uh, open your Bibles for those of you who have your hard copies. And then for my electronic savvy friends, I'm going to encourage you to pull down our app. Uh, if you haven't, go out to our app store. It's very simple and it's free. And uh, at the very bottom, hit worship. And then uh, you tap on today's date, uh, which is uh, October the 24th. And voila, there it is. You'll see our uh, text today. It's coming from the book of Psalm, verses, uh, oh, chapter uh, 112. Let's look at 112. And we're going to look at the first three verses. But again, your homework assignment is to read the entire chapter. In fact, I'm going to talk about the whole chapter in and of itself. Uh, and uh, a great thing about having our app uh, you can have different Bible translations. You can do different devotions on it. You can do all your registration. You can do all your giving. You can do all your growth groups on it and, uh, and all those great things that we can keep you posted. So now I'm going to come from the NIV translation. And so for those of you who have your Bibles and uh, have it, it's Psalm 112, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you need me to hold up, say hold up. Now you online, tap on the glass. Okay, I don't hear anybody, so we're good. All right, so uh, hear, hear, hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, no, yes, it says, praise the Lord. Bless those who fear the Lord, those who, what? Uh, find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land, I believe. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Here's verse number three. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Now, uh, this is a very short psalm. It's called a uh, acrostic or an alphabet psalm meaning that uh, it uses the uh, Hebrew alphabets uh, to, to lay it out. And the reason it is done that way is because a, lo a lot of the Hebrew writings before they were written down were memorized, and they didn't have the printing press as we do today, and so it made it easy to memorize them. How many of you know your ABCs? Don't raise your hand. Don't, yeah, because some, yeah, cause I, I don't want to ask you to do that right now because it's been a while for some of you, and some of you might mess it up. But for, for, for the Hebrew, they had 22 alphabets, and so the, for each line, it would start with one of their alphabets. And now, this psalm, if you go back, and I want you to read also Psalm 111, this would be considered a sister psalm or a twin uh, to that because it's the same length. Uh, it uses a lot of the same words, a lot of the same language a lot of the same style, and, uh, and for many, uh, they believe it's the same writer. And so when you look at that, uh, also read Psalm 111. Now, when you look at this psalm, it starts off, in fact, let me ask you, how many of you speak Hebrew fluently? Nobody? 
All right, so today we're going to get your Hebrew lesson. I'm going to take you to a Hebrew class, and I'm going to make you, you can be able to speak it very fluent. You're going to be amazed how well you can do. The writer opens up with the word, praise the Lord. Now, now, for, for those of us, uh, we say that often. How, don't we say that often? In fact, we were just singing that. But really, the word in Hebrew, now, y'all ready? Here's your Hebrew word. I want you to say it with me. Say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Look at y'all. Look at y'all. Let's say it again. See, now, I thought you couldn't speak it fluently. You speak it very well, don't you? Now, that, that is a Hebrew compound word. Uh, hala means praise or adoration, and Yah is a shortened version of Yahweh. And so when you put it together, you get praise the Lord. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, let's translate it. What is that in Hebrew? Look at y'all, look at y'all. See, now y'all ready for Hebrew 101, all right? And, and so, so the writer opens up now with this phrase, praise the Lord, is actually what he closes with as well in, in, in uh, chapter uh, 111. And he's saying now, he's saying praise the Lord. Now, I talked about this a little bit on last week. When we talk about praising the Lord, this isn't for the ignorant, it's for the intelligent. And I don't mean that in a crass way, but so that you can understand, you can't praise someone one or something that you don't know about, right? And so he's opening up here, and he's telling us now, praise the Lord. And he's telling this to a certain group of people. He's not telling it to anyone or everyone. And all of us should have some praise on our lips. Did God just wake you up this morning? You ought to say, praise the Lord. I, yeah, I, I know we got some aches, and I know we got some pains, and I know things aren't going as well as we would want them to, but you made your way into the house of the Lord. You ought to be able to say, praise the Lord. You ought to be able to say, hallelujah. You ought to be able to say, thank you, Lord. Sometimes we just don't spend enough time just pausing and praising him for what he's already done. I mean, isn't it just good what he's already done? Is there not anybody else in here who knows what he has done for you? Has he done anything for anybody in here other than for myself? If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? I can tell you where I would be. I would be six feet under right now if it had not been. I can give you many of stories when God showed up and showed out when I wasn't even thinking about him. He was doing great things and he was doing good things. And before that reason alone, I can say, praise the Lord. This is what the writer is talking about. He's talking about our praising the Lord uh, in all of our circumstances and situations. And, and why is that so important? Because when you start thinking about leaving an inheritance, I just told you about all the things that can occupy our minds, all the things that can cause us to not think about the future that we might have or the future we should have and the future we ought to leave to our children. And so here he's saying, now he starts right out out of the gate. He says, praise the Lord. And then he goes on and tells us who. He says, blessed are those who do what? Fear the Lord. Now, 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 this word blessed, we hear it all the time, but it means favored, highly favored uh, by a divine one. And for the writer here, he tells you who that is because he started off by praising the one who's going to bless the ones who do what? Fear the Lord. Now, we all hear that word fear. In fact, we studied it in our deeper dive on Wednesday. And for those of you who haven't uh, had a chance, you can come out on Wednesdays at noontime. And we start at what time? <laughs> yeah, see, that's another one of those trick questions. What time do we start at noontime? Noon. And we do it on Wednesday. So what day is it? At what time? Yeah, and in fact, this is going to be our last one for a while, so please come on out and we'll be online and in-house. But we talked about having this fear for the Lord. Now, the word fear in and of itself is not a bad word. It's not an evil word as most of us have it in our minds. Uh, when you think about fear, uh, let me just give you, if I could give you a definition of fear. Fear is the deep reverence and respect uh, for someone or something, uh, of someone's or something's power and authority, all right? Or the power and authority of someone or something, all right? So that's what fear is. Uh, and so now let me just watch how, how we use fear. We tell our children uh, to, to be careful or to fear when they go across the street, right? Why? Because we respect 
and reverence the power and authority of a vehicle, right? We tell them that, right? We tell them the same thing about strangers. We tell them to be careful of a stranger because we respect, right, the authority and power, right? Come on, because we don't know what that stranger might do, so it's better to be a little cautious with them, and in doing so, uh, we should respect nature. In fact, how many of you love the beach? Oh, isn't it a beautiful thing? But we have to respect and reverence the power and authority of the ocean. I mean, I love going in it, but you, do you not know you can drown in that? Yeah, it can just take you out. So we respect the power and authority of the ocean. And, and so he's saying here now is so fear in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it, now we have to look at the object of our fear. The object of what we're going to have deep respect and reverence for their power and authority. And he helps us out here. Notice the object. He says, blessed are those who do what? Fear. What's the object? The Lord. So here now, he's telling us who we should have deep reverence and respect for their power and authority is of the Lord. He didn't just say any God. He says Yahweh. And he gave us that name when we said Praise the Lord, and that's the same name. He's talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he's saying now that we are to have the deep respect and reverence for his power and authority. Now, why is that so important? Because there's a lot of things we fear. Anybody in here got some fears? Come on, let's be honest with what I said. Come on, raise your hand. You've got some fears. All right, now, now watch how if you put this in perspective now. If you have, if, if your fear is first and foremost for the God of the universe, then you shouldn't have to get paralyzed by any other fear. You shouldn't get paralyzed uh, by uh, your fear of your enemy. All right, you shouldn't get paralyzed by bad news. How many of you, oh man, it's going to be bad. Oh, I know how bad it's going to be. I, I, I just don't know uh, w w what I'm going to do uh, when this news comes. You go to the doctor, they tell you they saw something, and it's real. Now, it's not that bad news not real, because isn't bad news real? We've gotten bad news before, right? But he's, he's not talking about that, that we're being uh, naive about it. He's talking about us having a proper perspective about this bad news. And he's saying now, why should we uh, have this fear and reverence and, and respect for this, for this one we call God? Well, here's why. Because every intention of God is good for you. Amen. Uh, somebody ought to say amen. Every intention of God is good for you. So if every intention of God is good for you, and then you give him his reverence and his respect because of his power and authority, we know that whatever God does for us is good. And watch this. And everything God doesn't do for us is good. Oh, see, well, come on. We see, we always are talking about what God does for us. Let's talk about some of the things God doesn't do for us. Sometimes the things God doesn't do for us is better than the things we want God to to do for us. And because of that, we can just praise him and we can thank him for being that kind of God. I'm so glad that God didn't do the things to me that God could have done. I'm so glad that God didn't take me out when he should have taken me out. I'm so glad that God has been better to me than I have been to myself. And because of that, guess what I can do? I can Are y'all seeing this here? And, 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 and why is this so important when you're talking about leaving a good inheritance? You say, what does this have to do with it? It has everything to do with it. The reason being is because a lot of times we spend more time worrying about the bad news and the bad things that are happening. We don't spend enough time worrying about what God is going to do and what God has done and what God is doing and what God is not doing. I just, you know, I just get excited when I had to, I had to just pause there and just, think about all the things God has not done. And even some of the things you have been praying for. I know some of you have been praying for some things. You've been praying for houses. You've been praying for spouses. You've been praying for jobs. You've been praying for relief. You've been praying for miracles. You've been praying for uh, your children. And sometimes God hasn't said a word. And for most of us, that can become depressing. Let's be honest. It's like God doesn't hear us. 
when the truth of the matter is, if God is good and all of his intentions are good, then we can rely on his word, which is good. And in his word, he says, everything works together for good for those who love the Lord and who are what called according to his purpose. So then the question becomes, if God is delaying something or if God is saying no about something, it is for your good. And that ought to be good news for some of us because we've been waiting for some things for a mighty long time and God hadn't showed up and we had, he hadn't showed out. But guess what? Because of his nature and because he's that kind of God, we can have Peace which surpasses all understanding. And we can praise his. We can say, Halle, 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 Halle. So, all those things, watch this. When you fear God first, you don't have to fear anything else. Nothing else. Bad doctor's reports. Uh, bad news, uh, bad day at work, uh, whatever it is that you fear. If you put him first and foremost, all your other fears should start to diminish. Now, it takes time. This doesn't happen overnight. This is, this is a process, you see. And this is why he says those who are favored by him fear him, and they have that right respect for him. All right. Now, notice what it goes on to say next. It's not only does it say uh, that, uh, you, uh, that you will have um, the fear of the Lord, but it also says that you who find great delight in his commands. I think I skipped that when I quoted it. Uh, who find great delight, find great. How do you find it? This word again means searching and seeking, that you're going to study God's word. And, and watch this now. He's saying that you're going to find great delight in his commands. Most of us hate commands. Most of us hate when he says, God says, you shall not. Because we look at him as a cosmic killjoy, that he wants to take away all of our fun. How many of you got out your parents' house because they kept saying what you couldn't do? Yeah, I left. I mean, I graduated on the 17th of June, and I was gone on the 24th of June. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was out of there. Yeah, never to return. Because everything they said I couldn't do, I wanted to do. And I was big and bad and bold enough, and I wanted to. And that's how we feel about God's commands sometimes, that we don't want to do church, or we don't want to be in a right relationship with God, because we feel that God wants to take away all of our fun. But didn't I just say earlier that all of God's intentions for us are good? So if all of God's intentions for us are good, then everything in His Word is good for us. And anything He tells us not to do is for our good, and, and, and that ought to be good news for us. But most of us keep his, his, his commands not out of delight, but out of duty. Oh, I guess I better go ahead on and do this or else. God will be mad at me. He, yeah, he won't like me no more. Now, when you do anything out of duty instead of delight, you might as well not have done it. That's disobedience. God is looking at our hearts. He wants to see why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, you remember I talked about last week, the only reason I go down Lincoln at 25 miles an hour? It's not because I like the speed limit. I just don't want that ticket. Right? I'm doing it out of duty. But when I look at God's Word and God tells me how to spend my time, how to spend my talent, and how to spend my treasure, then if I do that with delight, because this is what His Word says, He tells me that I'm going to be blessed because of it. I'm going to find favor because, why? Because I'm doing what God has instructed us to do. And this word delight means we do it with exceeding joy, that we're just excited about what God said for me to do. He told me not to sleep with my neighbor's wife. Oh, that is good news. He told me not to steal from my neighbor. He told me not to lie to my neighbor. He told me not to cover what my neighbor has. 
Is that not good news? I don't, let you out. All the stuff I want to do. No. No, no, no. He's saying that we ought to do those things out of delight. So let me give you your first lasting impression here that if you want to leave a good inheritance here, fear and delight can live in the same heart together. Watch this now. Because they, what? By the same love. The love of God. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you're going to fear the Lord you, and you're going to keep his command, you can put both of those in your heart at the same time. They can coexist. They can live there together uh, because it's God who has put them there, and it's, you're doing it because you love him. You don't keep the law out of legalism. You keep it out of love. See, here's something. You can't legislate love. You can make all the laws you want. We can pass all the laws in the world that we want, but you can't make anybody love you. That is your self-control. That's something that you desire. That's something you must want to do. And I'm so grateful that God loves me in spite of me. And he's asking us to be his image bearers and to love others in spite of themselves. Sometimes we got to like love folks that don't love you. Say ouch if you can't say amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so, so now, so what's the next thing that he wants us to do? Next, look what he says next. Their children will be mighty in the land, I believe is what it says. Now, let me just help you understand this now. We got to keep this in its Old Testament context. You got to remember that this was written to the children of Israel whom God had promised them uh, the promised land that was flowing with milk and honey. And a lot of these things here that we can't take individually, but we have to take collectively what God meant for all of his people of Israel. And so when he says their children, another word for that is their descendants. Uh, that means their children, children, and their 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 children, all the way out the centuries, just like his word says, that he would bless them for a thousand generations. And so he's talking about here that they would be mighty in their land. We can be mighty in our land too. And how does that look? Well, when you get some people who love the Lord, who are following his commands, and you put them in places of importance, guess what they do? They change how society lives. Because people need to see other God-fearing people doing what thus saith the Lord instead of what thus saith the Republicans or the Democrats or the Independents. Okay, I didn't, right, let me go. I need to step over here. Is this helping anyone? Now, now why, why again is this important? Because when you understand God's promises. You have to understand that he, he, some of them, you have to look at them in totality. And the people of, of Israel were a communal people. See, we're so individual that if I get, if I get a blessing, you're not going to be happy for me. You're going to envy me. But the children of Israel, if one of them had, they all had, because that's how they operated as a community. And we as the church are supposed to emulate that because we are God's chosen people now. And because of that, we're supposed to live in such a way that when your children are in power, that, that's as good as my child being there. And when someone else's child is there, that's as good as your child. Why? Because we all have the same father. We all are loved by God. And if we have him as our father, we should be happy for them. And look at what it says next, the generation of the upright. Now, what does that word mean, upright? That means a person who does what is right, uh, and when he doesn't do what is right, he goes back and does what is right. You see, that means we don't always get it right. But when we don't get it right, we go back and we get it right. And that's the beauty and the power of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing that when you mess up, God gives you the power and the ability to go and ask somebody for forgiveness and that you can say, you know what, give me a do-over. Aren't you glad God is good in doing do-overs? How many of you need a do-over with some relationships? Yes, indeed. So, so see, when you get a do-over in some relationship, you can lead that kind of ability to your children. They need to show, you need to show how mom and daddy know how to make things right when they don't do right. You don't have to be right all the time, but you have to know the one who's right all the time, and you have to follow what he says as often as you can. And when you do wrong, you got to go back and do right. Isn't that good news? 
and that's good news. And he says that, guess what? We'll be blessed. Now, this word blessed isn't the same one up there, but it still means, this means something will be coming. It doesn't happen immediately. Sometimes your blessings may come further down the road, and, and sometimes we stop right short of the goal line. Have you ever been doing something a long, long time you just say, you know what, I'm just sick and tired of giving my time, my talent, and my treasure. Nothing's going to come of it. Oftentimes, God is looking at your heart. Why are you doing it? If you're doing it to get something, no, you're not going to get anything. But if you're doing it to give something, then you're going to serve a God who's going to keep giving to you. And he's just waiting for you to get in line with him and do what he asks you to do. And he's just waiting. Sometimes God is just sitting there waiting. Amen. Just sitting there waiting. Because mm-hmm. he wants you to leave a good inheritance to whom? Your children, their children, their children, their children. And it's not all about money. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but it's not all about money. It's about leaving, what, a good legacy like we've been talking about. Good wisdom, a good story, a good name. How many of you want to leave a good name? Amen. Yeah, well, it starts with fear in the Lord. Now, and go back, and it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you go back to the sister t- uh, psalm, I think that's uh, verse number 10. It tells us that, and I think it also tells us that in uh, Proverbs 1, 7. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what have we been saying that wisdom is? Wisdom is doing the right thing at the right time, right, with the right knowledge for your situation. All right, being able to do that for your situation. And when you do that over and over and over and over again consistently, guess what you're going to leave your children? You're going to leave them a legacy of a behavior that they can practice, that they can pass on to their children, that they can pass on to their children, that they can pass on to their children. And those, guess what this is going to happen? God's favor is going to follow them. How many of you want God's favor to follow your children? Come on now, how many of you want that to happen? Now he's talking about a legacy here, that what you leave behind, God God can just carry on from the next generation to the next generation. So let me give you your second uh, lasting impression here. Uh, Watch this. God's favor will extend to your godly children for future generations. That means way down the road. How many of you, you know that there's some generations you won't see, but because of how you lived your life now and because of what you're doing right now, God's going to bless them because they're going to follow God's word because you follow God's word and their parents follow God's word and their parent and then their parent and their parent. And that just blessing just keeps flowing just like a river. Isn't that something? God's blessings just keep flowing from one generation to the next. Now, that, that's better than any money any riches, because they come and they go. Uh, But the Word of God and God Himself will last forever. Now watch this last part. Watch this last part here. It says, wealth and riches are in their houses. Again, remember I said, this isn't a blanket statement. He's talking about what happens when you carry a certain type of behavior over and over and over again. You put the odds in your favor. Now, you have to understand that the children of Israel, uh, everybody wasn't rich. Why? How do you know that? Because when you read the book of Deuteronomy, it tells what the rich folks are supposed to do for the poor folks. So what is he talking about again? Communal. He's talking about certain people. There will be those who will have more than others. There will be those who will have more than others. And they didn't get it illegally. Say amen. God blessed them with it, and they got it in their houses. And guess what? They used those things. When you go back, and I believe it's verses 7, 8, you go back and you read those verses there, you'll see where it talks about they don't fear their enemies, uh, that they give their money to good causes. They Watch this now. So you, you don't have to fear giving your money uh, to any good cause. Y'all hear me now? Y'all hear me now? You don't have to fear that. A lot of times we don't give because we're afraid that if I don't, if, if I get that, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Uh, I can't afford not to. But he's saying here that no, uh, when God blesses you, it's not only to take care of your needs, but it's so you can take care of the needs of others. Look at it. It's right there in the text, I believe. It's in verse 7. I, I need us to look at that one. Let's look at that one. I, yeah, I don't want you to miss that one. Because sometimes y'all say, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not right there. I believe, I believe, I believe. Let me see here. Let me see. 
Okay, I was wrong. It's verse 9. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Hmm. No, you see that word freely? Again, that means delightful, that they're not holding it like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this because you say I got to do it. No, he's talking about freely. Why? Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because when you do that, God is, you're saying, God, I trust you more and myself less. And the more you trust God, the more God can trust you. And a lot of times we don't have, it's not because we can't do for ourselves, but we're trying to manipulate God. But God wants us to do because we just freely love doing. How many just love to give? Don't raise your hand. Don't you're on camera. Don't, don't, don't. Because God knows. See, some of you are going to raise your hand because everybody else raised their hand, and you know you're lying. You can't not, not, you know, if you ask a question like that, you got to put your hand up, right? You can't have folks thinking that, no, I don't like giving. So go ahead on, let's raise your hand. How many of you like giving? Come on, you like giving. Yeah, that's how God designed it. Now, the question is, how many have given? Don't raise your hand. See, there's a difference in what you like to do and what you're doing. See, most of us like to do some things, but we don't. Why? We do it because of fear. We fear what will happen if we do what we know we should do. And because we are fearful, that means we don't have the right fear, and we need to have the right fear in who? We need to fear God first and foremost. We need to have a deep respect and reverence for His power and authority. And that doesn't mean you won't get bad news, but when you're going through a bad period in life, you don't have to worry because because God has already taken care of it, and he has made a way. You see, we aren't the only one that's had bad experiences. For those of you who know a little bit about the Bible, look at Joseph. Joseph had a bad experience. One of the 12 brothers of Israel, uh, sons, one of the 12 sons of Israel, his brother sold him into slavery, and he was there. But what? God, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, there's some things that might happen to you that might seem bad, but God is doing something through you, for you, and to you. Sometimes he's helping you set up the next generation. Had Joseph not gone in, the whole generation of the children of Israel would have suffered. So sometimes our suffering is for the benefit of others. And I'm just so glad that God knows better that what I need than I do, because I'll mess it up. You can raise your hand if you think you'll mess it up. You'll mess it up. But if you want to leave behind a good inheritance, then you must put your trust in the only one who always just means good for you. And the only one that means good for you all the time is the one who came down 42 long generations. We call him Jesus, Mary's baby, the one who took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed a multitude. He turned water into wine. He healed the sick, the lame, the blind. He caused them to be able to be whole again. And why? Because he wanted to leave a good inheritance. And what inheritance did he leave? It was the blood that he left for us. And that's the same blood that can cover us. And when we have that blood on us, guess what? We can share that inheritance with your children, with your children's children, with your children's children, with your children's children, with your children's children, children's children. And that's the inheritance that God wants us to leave first. If you leave him some money, good. It's going to be gone in two to three years anyway. Yeah. First thing you're going to do is buy a car. First thing most of us do. Riding around, money is... Yeah. That's a whole nother lesson. Whole nother lesson. So let me give you your third life lesson here. Prosperity does not destroy the humility of your life, or the holiness of your life, and the humility of your heart. Now, let me just talk about that a little bit. See, if God blesses you with finances, it shouldn't change who you are as far as how you live according to God's Word. You should continue to be holy, all right? You should continue to be humble, See, that's why sometimes, can I talk plain? Sometimes the reason the Lord won't bless you is because he know how you act. That's why he won't let me sing. Because if he knew if I could sing, y'all wouldn't get out of here at about 2 o'clock. There'd be no choir over there. I would sing every song. 
I, I, are you with me here? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but no, see, see, we, God doesn't bless us with some things because we're not ready for it. Some things you won't, you're not ready for. That's why it's good that God doesn't do some things because it'll just mess you up. You think you can handle it. How many do you think you can handle it? Yeah, go ahead and tell the truth. You think you can handle it. That's why you're praying for it. You wouldn't be praying for stuff you don't think you can handle. How many say, Lord, give me this because I, I know I can't handle it, but I want it anyway. No. You're praying for it because you think you can handle it. But God knows best. I just told you, all of his intentions are good. Say amen. 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 All right, so uh, it's a little warm in here. Yeah, I see folks sleeping good. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. <laughs> Ain't it good to laugh? <sighs> I didn't need you to miss these takeaways. It's important that you get them. Let me give you the first one. You should not despise God's commands. You should delight in them. Okay? I think I've talked about that enough. But I can't, I can't express that enough because for too many of us, too many of us, we don't do it because we love the Lord. Let me just say this. The more you delight in his commands, the more you'll do them. And the more you do them, the more you'll love them. And the more you love them, the more you'll benefit from them. Why? Because everything God does for you is for good. It's for good. You want to leave a good inheritance? Follow what God says to do, and you will. All right? The second one here, your future generational societal influence would be stronger if they have a strong relationship with God. All right? You want to make an impact? All right? Impact your children. Here's the thing. If you're not living a godly life at home, don't come up here and play church. You're making it bad for the rest of us. All right? You're making it bad for the rest of us. What do we call those kind of folks that do that? Crazy. <laughs> yeah, we like to button it up. They're crazy. You live one way out here and another way in here. That's crazy. All right, don't do it. Don't do it. You, you're messing us up. All right, so now let's see. What's, what, what, I got one more? Let's see what the third one say here. All right, the third one says, what is true of God is true of a godly person. Hmm. Now, we don't have all the immutable characteristics of God, but we do have those that we can have that he endowed us with. If he's a loving God, we should be loving people. If he's a righteous God, we should be righteous people. If he's a holy God, we should be holy people. If he's a forgiving God, we should be forgiving people. If he's a generous God, we should be generous people. If he's a kind God, we ought to be kind people. If he's a gentle God, we ought to be gentle people. That's what it's saying right here. And if his righteousness endures forever, so will ours. Yeah, so will ours. And what better to leave your children than your right living with a God that only intends to do good 
for his people. And how do you do that? Let him order your steps. In what? In his word. When you allow him to order your steps in his word, guess who's coming behind you? Just look back now. Think about the generations who's coming. See your children. See your grandchildren. See your great grands. You got children you can't even, that you won't see now. That you can see later. And they'll get there. And they'll remember the legacy that you left. Oh, you may not get to see them. You got some children you may not get to see come in right now. But if you leave them, that kind of legacy, there'll be another day when God will come and he'll bring those with him who love him. Just look back. See your children. See your grandchildren. See your great grand. Look at those you don't even know yet. And all God wants you to do is leave a legacy that they can hold on to. So when life gets tough and life gets rough, they can talk about, I heard about my great granddaddy. I heard about my great grandmama, and I heard how they held on to God's unchanging hand, and they allowed him to order their steps, even when it didn't look right, even when things weren't going good. They could say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If I withdraw thy hand from thee, whether shall I go hold on, my brothers and sisters? Hold on to a God that doesn't mean anything but good for you. All his intentions, everything that he's ever done. How do I know? Because he sent his son while I was not even thinking about him to come and die in my place when I deserve to die. He sent him. And you know what I want him to do now? Just order my steps. Order my steps. Order my steps, Lord. Hey!